Okay, Allie, both Allie and Journey is going to read. Allie is reading from the Amplified Bible, is that right? Mm -hmm. And then Journey. Okay, Allie, read out loud now. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the abundant blessing of Christ. Romans 15, 29. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Very good. Now, you're going to pray for me. Journey's going to pray for me. I would... I want you both to put a, a hand on my head when you pray. Now what this is about is, is we're praying that God will bless what we say tonight. Put your hand on my head, Ellie. All right, Journey. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give um, Brother Given's heart and mouth power to um, speak and his words will be a blessing to us and um, I love you and and we'll have ears to hear in Jesus' name I pray, amen. To grow up knowing what's involved in amen. the word of God being preached My message tonight is the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, as he wrote to the Romans, I'm sure. I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Some other verses in place of fullness read the full measure. Basic Bible English says the full of I'm full of the blessing of Christ. The Holman Bible says the fullest blessing of Christ. Tyndale says the abundance of the blessing of Christ. Now I'm interested in this fullness. I'm not a member of the here a little, there a little. Amen. I'm not part of that group. Amen. I want to comment on that a little bit, here a little, there a little. I've heard people, unlearned people, say this is the way God teaches you, a little, here a little, there a little. All right, now, here it is in Isaiah. I'm going to tell you why you'd never want to be here a little, there a little. Bits and pieces little samplings, little examples. You want to pray for deliverance from that. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that. That, in order that, they might go and fall backward and be broken, yeah. snared, and taken. Yeah. Now, I dedicate that to the preachers and teachers that just teach a little here and there. This is how God rejects people. He puts a little here. Little there, little more here, 
little more of that, a little more there. And what it is, it's compiled weights that's going to confirm that they're not deserving of this kind of thing. So that's not what I'm going to be preaching about here, little, there, little. <laughs> Unlike the law, the gospel is not a listing of responsibilities. It's a message of divine provision. I say it's completely, this is completely different now than Moses and the prophets. This is completely different. It's not a way of life. That's what he's not, this isn't what he's announcing. It's an announcement of life. It's not a changing message that needs to be updated. This is an everlasting gospel. Amen. Amen. At least two times, once to the Corinthians and once to the Galatians, Paul talked about another gospel. That gospel didn't come from God, another gospel. He said to the Galatians, which is not another. There's only one gospel. That's all there is. And it's not one that tells you what you ought to do. It tells you what God has done through Jesus Christ. This gospel involves such things as coming into Christ. Hey, nobody come into Moses. The Lord didn't tell him to come into Moses. We're baptized into Christ. Why well, it talks about abiding in Christ. How about that? It talks about getting ready to meet Christ. It talks about things like comprehending, apprehending, discerning. It talks about being perfect. Before God we're talking about, before God we're talking about. Perfecting holiness. I mean, how are you doing in this assignment? This is an assignment from heaven. I'm quite serious. As though we have in these promises, brethren, let's perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. Amen. See, the gospel is announcement of what's needed to do those things. That's the good news of blessing. Friends, this is called the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4.23. See, some people think that they think of kingdoms on earth. So they hear about the kingdom of Korea. Whoa, it's some other kingdom of Russia. Whoa. The gospel's good news of not a kingdom, the kingdom. Amen. There's actually only one kingdom. The kingdom is the Lord's. So the gospel announces that kingdom. It's not evident. It's not evident that God's ruling. So some people think he really isn't. Actually, someone else has said this, but I'll say it again. God's the only one that has free will because he's got to have it to run his kingdom. Amen. This uh, gospel, it's the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, 24. It's the announcement of something that hitherto was not known, not to any significant degree. Moses didn't talk about grace. And when you read the word grace in the scriptures, there's only one person saying to another person, if I found grace in your sight. This was not a subject of Moses and the prophets, not grace. It was like 
hidden in the tabernacle. Like the manna was hidden in the tabernacle. The grace of God. The good news about the grace. What's the good? Well, it's accessible, brethren. It's accessible. Amen. You can find grace to help in the time of need. Amen. It's the, called the gospel of God. How's that? God is it known. And, and so, knowing God is so critical that when Jesus comes, he's going to take flaming, he's coming in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God. All right, we got a good news. We got the gospel of God. It's a good news about God. <laughs> Maybe you didn't know it. But God has made provision for sinners. Maybe you didn't know it. But God's not anxious to damn anybody. Maybe you didn't know it. But God has what you need to please him. That's good news, good news. It's the gospel or good news of Christ. Christ is the person on whom your destiny is hinged. He's the anointed one. There aren't any others. Of old time, people knew someone's coming. It's going to be the root of Jesse. It's going to be like a plant springing up out of dry, dry ground. It's going to be God's servant. They didn't know who it was. They wondered if when John the Baptist started preaching, it was he, he was so radically different. If you wanted to hear John the Baptist, let me tell you, you had to go to him. He wouldn't come to you. And they flocked out. They never heard anything like this. They thought maybe he was the Christ. So I said, I'm no. Oh, when the Christ comes, I'm not worthy to carry his shoes. The gospel. The fullness of the blessing of the gospel. So we're commenting a little on the gospel here. It's the uh, Romans 10, 15. The gospel of peace. You probably have experienced feeling enmity against God. Uh, sometimes people say, I got mad at God. I, well, I don't recommend that. This is the announcement of the gospel of peace. What does it mean? Jesus made peace Amen. through the blood of his cross. <laughs> he made it. The gospel's announcing peace. You can have it. You don't have it tonight. You can get it. It's a gospel of peace. I like this, Ephesians 1.13. It's the gospel of your salvation. The gospel is an explanation of what happened to you when you were saved. Spells it out for you. A great thing happened when you were saved. Let me tell you that. The gospel. See, the good news of the gospel, it involves like getting ready for Christ, getting ready to leave the world. Are you ready to leave the world? You're going to leave it. Amen. Get ready for it. Amen. I'll tell you something else about the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4.15 says we're begotten through the gospel. I mean, this is what God uses to beget is what's born that's begotten. Everybody understands that. Abraham begat sons and Sarah birthed them, birthed the son. He begat us through the gospel, the word of the truth of the gospel. So if there's no gospel preached, hey, there's no new births. There's no new births. But if it is preached, this is what God's going to use to beget children. The gospel. The gospel, it, it's illuminating. It brings life and immortality to light. Yeah. 
What is your life? And Jesus asked his disciples, what is your life? Yeah. James said, well, it's a vapor. That's what it is. Yes. Well, there's a little gospel that sheds a little more, <laughs> sheds a little more light on it. What he's defining isn't your life as it was exited from the womb of your mother. He's talking about the life you have in Christ Jesus. It's an exposition of life. Let me tell you, this is the truth. What I'm telling you is the truth. People that are alive to God are responsive to him. Amen. They can hear him. They can sense him. They can know when he's here and when he's not here. They're alive to God. And the gospel announces life and immortality. That means never die. Amen. Amen. Even if you go to hell, you don't. You never come to a point where you don't exist. And the gospel defines that. Now, some people, and my heart goes out to them, life is so miserable because of their circumstances, they can't even think of living forever. I mean, it's... it's life for them is, is that hard. You probably know people like, maybe you were in there. Maybe you were where it was harder to live than to die. The gospel announces immortality. It's not over yet. Amen. There is a life to come. Yes. And there's nothing bad about it. You won't be in the presence of the Lord a millisecond till you'll be shouting for joy. Yeah, Brings immortality to light through the gospel, the scripture says. Now the word of God says that we are partakers. That means you get some of what's on the table. You, know, you could eat what's on the table. We're partakers of the promise by the gospel. That's Ephesians 3, 6. So the gospel tells you what's on the table. Why, brethren, it's a feast of fat things and why is not in the least. It's a fabulous feast, this feast of salvation. It's not paltry. It's not minuscule. It's not rationed. And so you begin to be partakers. This news is so good that when it gets down in your soul, you start eating. And you start drinking. And you start expecting. <laughs> and you start looking forward to. You begin to be discontent with this old world because there's nothing in this world to compare with this. All right, now remember, we're talking about the fullness of of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. The, f the fullness of the blessing. Now let me just for a moment encapsulate some of the things that's associated with the gospel. Fullness. I'm, I'm describing now this fullness. What Some of the things that it involves. Acceptance by God. Access to God, adopted by God, atonement for sin. These, these are all in the gospel now. The destruction of the devil, freed from condemnation, huh? freed from the law, huh? freed from the law of sin and death. I'm telling you what's inherent. This is the fullness. I'm breaking down the fullness here. The gift of the Holy Spirit. The high priesthood of Christ. An eternal inheritance. The intercession of Christ. And the intercession of the Holy Spirit. A new creation. The kingship of Jesus. This is fullness. We're talking about the fullness of the gospel. Propitiation is a covering. So God can't see your sin. So he's got to use this kind of dumbed down language because of how we are. We can't, we can't understand about the eradication of sin. See that? So he says covered. It's 
covered, for, covered from him. If your sin's forgiven, God can't even see it. This is in the fullness. I'm talking about the fullness of the gospel. We receive not only the spirit, we receive the spirit of power and the spirit of love and the spirit of a sound mind. See, Paul says, I'm going to come in this guy. I'm going to come. These are the things I'm going to be talking about. I'm coming in the fullness of the gospel. There's reconciliation. <laughs> There's remission. There's sanctification. That is the name of God stamped on you. You belong to him. A satisfied God. God saw the travail of Christ's soul. He's, I'm satisfied. I'm not going to ask for any other price. I'm not going to ask for anything to be done, any more to be done. I'm satisfied. You can be too. That's the fullness of the gospel, see. Then there's a second coming of Christ. First coming, he came to deal with sin. Second coming, he's not coming to deal with sin. I dedicate those this to those who think he's coming to fight a war. I mean, I, I mean, you're dead wrong, but I won't embarrass you. Jesus isn't coming to fight. He's already won the fight. Amen. He defeated the last, the last enemy. He, he done been defeated. He destroyed the devil and plundered principalities and powers. So he's coming a second time to pick up his bride. He came to earth because he wanted a bride. He humbled himself. He humbled himself down. But he couldn't have a bride if he didn't do that. So he was willing to forfeit the prerogatives of deity to have a bride. And when the thing's all over, 1 Corinthians 15 tells you, he's going to turn the kingdom back to God that God may be all in all. Talk about humil humility. That's what it cost. That's what it cost for you to be saved. This isn't what Jesus was when he was the word. The word in the beginning was with God. This isn't, this isn't what he was then. The gospel announces this, that if it wasn't for salvation, the gospel of your salvation, if it wasn't for that, the humiliation of Christ, the humbling himself and becoming a servant, that would not make any kind of sense at all. It would cause a lot of problems, see? But that's the truth. The fullness of the gospel includes that. The fullness of the gospel tells you why Jesus died. You can search Acts from beginning to end and nobody in Acts told people why Jesus died. Hmm. Read it, but you don't believe it. Just read it. But the fullness of the blessing tells you why he died. He died because that was the way God could destroy sin. He gathered it all together in one place. He laid it on Christ. And then he cursed him. Even nature bowed its head. Became dark for a period of time. But after he'd taken, he was taken away the sin of the world. He had been made a curse for us, as Galatians 3.13 says. He was made sin for us, as 2 Corinthians 5.19. That was before he died. When he said, it's finished. No more curse. Hmm? Nothing else required. Like he was saying, I'm ready now to give up my spirit. See, it's a miracle that Jesus died. You, you understand that, I'm sure. There was no sin in him. Sin had no claim on Jesus. And when he died, the sin had been taken, the sin had been taken away, so he had to dismiss his spirit. And he did. 
the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ means that nothing that Jesus procured for you will be withheld from you. Amen. It's accessed by faith. We understand it's by grace through faith. But if you have faith, some people would say, well, that all ended back then. Just send those folk home. They're undeserving of hearing. Send them home. Jesus didn't die to launch something that was going to be obsolete in a couple of years. Amen. Or 50 years or 60 years. All the gifts, the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. This involves various gifts of grace, and they're always mentioned in abundant measure. We read about abundant grace, Romans 5, 17. Abundant joy. See, we're talking now about the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And Paul said to Timothy, the grace of God was exceeding abundant with faith and love. Amen. Talking about now the abundance or the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. When he shed forth his spirit, Titus 3, 6 says he did it abundantly. He poured it out on us abundantly. Amen. So if someone says to you, yeah, but that was just the apostles. Just rebuke them and go your way. They're not right. Educated or not. That's not the truth. And then first Peter 1 3 speaks about abundant mercy. Now, uh, if right now mercy doesn't mean, you know, a whole lot to you right now, there'll come a time in your life when mercy will be the most precious thing you ever thought. And you want mercy. You want to find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. And I'm telling you, when you find it, you don't get a little teacup full of it. It's abundant mercy. He keeps on a pouring until, it's, until your wound is mollified. He keeps on lavishing it till the thing's settled. Abundant mercy. And you read about things like, I remember we're talking about the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We read about the full assurance of understanding. Oh, how's that? Not some assurance, full assurance. Full assurance of understanding. How about this? The full assurance of faith. Or how about this? The full assurance of grace. Three full. <laughs> the blessings of God are pregnant with blessing. It's a pity that it's kind of like a uh, spiritual environment that's been created by church leaders where people never think of these things as being abundant. They're living on rationed goods. Let me tell you now, these people are going to account to God for what they taught. The gospel's telling us how much we got, and these people are telling us how little we got. Not going to be passed over. You can believe this, the fullness of the blessing. We read about exceeding joyful. <laughs> I mean, you probably had experience like this. You just can't contain it, you know. Exceeding. Sometimes they even dance. It gets uh, charged up about it. You read about exceeding grace. Now, what is exceeding? It means it keeps on, it's exponential. It keeps on growing. There's not an identified conclusion to grace. 
It's exceeding. Talk about the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Then he even uses the word exceeding abundant. <laughs> it's good. And he talked about the promise they're exceeding great and precious promises. Oh, how about that? Now, the, these things are difficult to apprehend, but we need, God's given us some help now here. God's given us some help. Sometimes you're not aware of how great the magnitude of these things is. And so, the Lord revealed now the Spirit helps our infirmities. We don't know what to pray for as we ought. This is just the truth of the matter. There's something critical at this time, perhaps, that you need, but you're not aware of it. You know, he's appointed and you got an intercessor in heaven. You got one there. You got an intercessor that's in you. He's in you. And he knows what you have need of. And he says that God knows the mind of the spirit. He they perfectly. I mean, they, it's the Holy Spirit doesn't have to explain anything to God. Sometimes we have to explain things. Not the Holy Spirit. He said, oh, no, Lord, you know that, that difficulty that brother and sister's having down there? They need and whatever they need. And because the Spirit asked, God will give. And I've thought of the curse of spiritual paupery and poverty. I tell you, uh, it's time to get to, tur to purge the church of dryness, unprofitability, and staleness. Amen. Kick it out the door. Amen. It doesn't have any place in salvation. Amen. Boredom's out of order. Staleness is out of order. Meager portions are out of order. It's out of order. We're talking about the fullness of the blessing of Jesus Christ. There's a fullness to be had. That's what I'm trying to announce. And then just to kind of underpin the whole thing, this is said, the gospel of Christ is the power of God Amen. unto salvation. Amen. Not initial salvation. Salvation from A to Z. From beginning to end. You're not fully saved yet. I mean, your body, this ought, you ought to know this. Your body is not saved. Your soul's not saved. It vacillates up and down. You have to say, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? You have to sanctify. But you've got the power. Gospel is the power. And I was, uh, subjected to the teaching that the gospel's for the sinner and you teach the saints. Now, I don't know who, who started this, but if we did, we ought to take their license away and send them back to school, grade school. As long as salvation aspects of salvation. Let's, let's, let's just name a couple of them. You are being conformed to the image of God's Son. Amen. That's not done yet. Amen. That's part of salvation. Don't anybody tell the people of God that the gospel is not to be preached to the church. In fact, we don't have any record of anyone else hearing the gospel. You see what? Read it. If you're scripture illiterate, just read it. Peter never did tell the Peter that Peter on the day of Pentecost never did tell people why Jesus died. Didn't tell them. Those who were scripture illiterate could could uh, could reason it out. He didn't tell Agrippa. He preached a sermon to Agrippa. He didn't tell him. 
He preached in the Solomon's court to a great host of Jews. He didn't tell them. He preached to the Sanhedrin. He didn't tell them. See, you get right down to it. You don't have an example of the gospel being preached to anybody except who's in. See, what does that mean, preach the gospel to every creature? Well, you're giving them a summation of it. I understand that. You're giving them a summation of the gospel. But it's expounded. It's too great. So let us have uh, more fullness. If tonight you feel as though you need the more fullness, you can have it. Amen. You can ask the Lord to fill you with it. And we can ask each other for the other, other brothers and sisters to fill. See, we, we're living in days, brethren, when you can't have half a tank. This is not the time. Amen. The church needs to be strong. Yeah. It doesn't mean to be need to be limp. We don't need limping lectures yeah. or juvenile jesting. This isn't the time. Yeah. Or meager messages or paltry platitudes or clever cliches. We don't need this. We need the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I mean, uh, I wish I could have done better, but I did the best I feel I could at this time. But I wanted to convince you, as best I could, to convince you of this, that nobody has to be without Amen. what salvation provides.